The contest was the most important thing for me. I mean, like, uh, playing the game was the most important thing. As far as I was concerned, it wasn't what I got from it or what was at the end, but the play all in our court, and that was the most important. Michael Foley of the Sunday Times, we're here to talk about Christy Ring. It's a century since the, the great man was born. When, what, what's the immediate thing that comes to mind when you think of Christy Ring? Like there's nine monster titles, eight All-Irelands, arguably the greatest hurler of all time. Well, I suppose like, you know, for, for our generation, I mean, obviously we never saw him. I was, I was three years old when he died. Um, so, you know, our, our perception of Ring is completely shaped through the few books that have been written, the documentaries that have been made, and you know the memories of the hurlers who would have played with him and the people, the people who would have known him. So it's a very much a, a second and third hand sort of idea of him. Mine and I, like when I think of Ring, it's funny actually. I, I, it's it's not so much the hurling achievements I think of. I, I think of being a kid at home, um, and like at the time we would have had a couple of hurling books around, but it wouldn't have been a time when it was loads of GA books. But one of the books we had was the Christie Ring biography written by Val Dargan, which was originally written in, in around 1979, just after he died. So, you know, with with nothing else to read that was GA related, if you were interested in it, you know, just reading about this guy and sort of the way that he heard being described in, as an almost superhuman thing. It was almost Herculean, everything he did. You know, you got this sense that people tr- literally genuinely traveled the link to him you know and you know then when you spoke to people who would have heard of him and who would have gone to see him they, they would they would kind of corroborate this feeling that like you know uh i saw i saw something with dennis call and recently he said that re- even at the end of his days they played a they played a challenge game somewhere up the country and ten thousand people turned up to see a Glen Rovers challenge game. This is this is Ring in his late forties, but they just they went to see him, and then they go on and they wanted to shake his hand and say they, they they shook the hand of the greatest of all time, and I suppose it's such a different, it's a, such a different definition of greatness as we have now. We have all these sort of, I suppose, you know, we we have a different analysis of hurling now, and we have different access to seeing what we would consider to be the greatest players of of our era, um, and we have more access to seeing them. They play more games now. Um, it was one of the things that made the Railway Cup so important was because you got to see all these great players of the era back in the 40s, 50s and 60s together playing when they wouldn't have been on television much. So people thronged to see Ring playing for Munster and, and they came away with the memory and they talk about that memory and they cherish that memory. That one single thing. Like, I, I read an article in the Sunday Times, Dennis Walsh wrote it at the weekend and I was just looking at it online and there's a couple of comments from people reminiscing about one single memory they had of ring it might have been him taking a sideline cut or ducking out of a tackle or something like that but they hold the memory because they knew they were seeing something special and it's different it's different to how we treat greatness now because you just didn't see ring all the time he wasn't on your television screen all the time you had to go to see him it was a whole event to go and see ring and that sense that's that special sense around him that mystique like i work with a fellow from Kilkenny for the last 20 years he's a great great fan of hurling and he'd always be teasing that Christy Ring never existed at all you know it's just all made up it's a made up thing by cock people it couldn't possibly have existed you know and but there is an element to that too like there is this sort of Herculean as I say element this mystic element about how good was Ring and for our generation like we we never really know apart from the bits of footage that we see and this sense of him and it's a it's, it's maybe it's a measure of his greatness Shane like that that sense of him, the sense of what this guy was 50, 60 years ago, it's still there today. We can still feel it. When you when you ask me what I what, what I what I think of Ringer, it's the sense of him is what I get. This kind of fearless, courageous, ambitious, horror man um, who kind of embodies everything that you'd hope to see in a great sports person, you know? I suppose the fact that he doesn't seem like, you know, he didn't, didn't do a lot of interviews. We don't know the person. That, that's the mystique also. It feeds into that. Jimmy Smith, the former Clare hurler, he was talking about him. He said the minute he hit the pitch, the daisies got a sudden death. And he went on to say he was perfection itself. Now, when, when you talk about what you were going to go see when you went to see him, is it, is it a guy who was like 
all style as we saw in those famous skill videos where he's like doubling on the ball in the air or taking freeze and it does look like poetry in motion it genuinely does and it kind of lift the hairs on the back of your neck even thinking about it um, or is it something to do with like the force of will when he's on the field the fact that no matter what he is going to get that score or he's going to make that hit or whatever was required what was it about I think it was all of those things. Actually, do you know the story about the, that, those those skills videos? They were made by Louis Marcus. And do you know the story about the slow motion? No. He he when they were doing the videos, he, so he was he was doing it. As you say, they're skills videos, right? But somewhere during the during during the process of recording them, Louis Marcus said to him, "Look, don't worry um, about if you make a mistake, right? We can do it again, and we'll be slowing them down anyway." And he said, "You'll be slowing them down." And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, how do you do that? And so Mark was explaining the process that it would, it, would, it would mean they'd have to use a bit more film for the process. And Ring said, actually, ah, don't be wasting film at all. He said, I'll just do it slower for you. <laughs> so like, he offered to do them in slow motion if they wanted. There's no fear of them. Like, they were still going to fly off the hurley once they hit them. But I think, you know, going back to what you did, the, the, the core of it there, what did you expect to see? I think, um, I think you can probably divide it up into different stages of his career. Obviously, like in his younger days, he seems to have been this all-encompassing sort of force of nature on the field that, you know, obviously Cork looked to him on the big days and he always delivered. I mean, fellas, I remember reading a line at his funeral, they said he never let us down, like he never let them down on the big day. Uh, and then as he gets older, obviously, like he, he finished his last his last game for Glen Rovers was in 1967. So like he was well up into his 40s and he hurled away, for, hurled away for Cork into his 40s. So it was a bit more sporadic. As, as, as the time went on later on Eddie Kerr his last game in Crow Park was 1962 I think the league final Kilkenny beat them well but Cork scored Cork scored 1-8 and Ring scored 1-5 from full forward Eddie Kerr played in that game and Kerr remembered you know it was sporadic bursts but he said he was still brilliant like I mean he was still the best Cork player on the field at that stage because he knew he was by all accounts he had a fantastic understanding of the game of hurling he had a fantastic way of of figuring out what the game needed from him and he always did and that, that probably helped him to to deliver it um and i think also you know the the the, the clip at the start there about about the contest if you look at ring and if you if you kind of look at the few things he said and the things that people other people said about him he had all the same qualities as you would look again for in an elite sports person now the ability to focus on the contest the ability the, the relentless practice, like relentless, relentless practice. Um, this singular mindset that he could close off the outside world and just focus in on what he needed to do. And just this, this ability to sort of break the game down. A very complicated game to those of us who can't play it very well, but to fellas who, who like him who can play it so well, break it down into very simple things. Guys, guys who hurled in the 70s when Ring was selector, they'd always say, that he always said, it's a lovely phrase, I think, he always said the right thing to the player. He told the player what he needed to hear. It might be complicated, but it made total sense to the player when Ring would say it to them quietly, you know, just before a game or whatever. It just made sense. So he had this he had this amazing understanding of what hurling was about and what it took to compete and what it took to win. Hmm. I spoke to Michal O'Mara Kartig earlier in the year and I asked him for his thoughts on Christy Ring and uh, here's what he told me. Well, he had all the skills and he was driven. There was nothing higher in life to him than hurling. Be it club or county or province. He was that driven. He won a minor All-Ireland in 1938, I think. And was his brother told me this. He was picked as a right halfback. And very early in the game, they got a 21, and he wasn't the designated free take. And he ran up and told the guy that was getting ready to take to get out of the way. <laughs> and, um, and the brother Willie said to me, and he scored a point, a goal, a goal, a goal, of course. And he was that way all his life. He had this supreme confidence in his own. But he was senior in 39. Can you imagine? I broadcast the final of the Railway Cup hurling match of 1963. 
and Christy Ring was still there on the monster team winning his 18th railway cup. Yeah, that's crazy. And he hardly missed a challenge game in all that spell. He had the skills, he was a tough man when he had to, but he was driven by hodling and he had great respect for people that would stand up to him and all that and himself and Mick Mackey were rivals and the famous photo. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what was he like as a person to chat to? Well he was he was a quiet, reserved man. He was um, later on when he became a selector. You know, he was he was a bit more open. Mm. But he was still Chris Deering, who was the king. Yeah, Michal and Hartig, he puts it he puts it quite well, doesn't he? He was still the king. He was still the king and I mean, you know, Michal talks there about the kind of man he was and, and you know, again it kind of encapsulates what you would have heard down the years. Like even as a kid, like when he was growing up in Klein, um, the first coach he had was actually a football man from Balangiri. He came across, he was the national school teacher in Klein and he would have spoke many, many years ago about young ring and this this hurler playing street leagues in Klein, very intense, not a kind of a, you know, a sort of a bright smiling 14 year old like you might expect at that age. He was intense and he was very, I mean, every single game he gave it everything. Um, Jerry Moynihan was his teacher's name and, and Jerry remembered like, a, a street league game where Jerry was refereeing and he gave a he gave a, a, a decision against against Ring's team that he didn't like and Ring was like just apoplectic like crying with temper he came up to him and he's that was that was the intensity of him even then you know um like he was five when you think about it like he was five foot nine he wasn't a big man like but he was strong he was so strong and they all and people always spoke about his wrists he had these huge wrists um there was a story told about him in Klein. He'd go back to Klein, like he played for Glen Rovers, obviously from Klein originally, but he would go back to Klein every Saturday to his mother. His father died when he was 16, which I suppose is another aspect of his personality. He kind of had to go out into the world and, and, and kind of make some, you know, make make the world his own at a, at a young age. But he used to go back to Klein a lot and he'd hurl away, as Michal said there, he, hurling was everything to him. Like he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, didn't really socialise. Hurling was his social life and he was his, he, it was his obsession. But this particular story anyway, <clears throat> excuse me, he had slitters lined up across the middle of the field and he was taking sideline cuts and they were sugar all pinging over the bar. But he had lads, he had a couple of, la- a couple of la- neighbours behind the goal and they were blocking the balls w- with their hurlies as they were coming over. But the lads remembered like the hur- the balls were coming at su- with such power and with such spin on them that they'd block with the hurlies and could sting your hand. The, the sting would come down the-, the hurley. So much power and so much spin that ring, he was about three quarters of the way across the field and with- he hit the sideline cut so hard off the ground, the ground stroke off the ground so hard, he actually snapped his own hurley with the power that he was able to apply to it. Um, and that wasn't like, I mean, you'll hear loads of apocryphal stories about Ring practicing, you know, or he, he practiced hitting the ball up against the doorbell at the Paris Priest house, this kind of stuff. Like this one really did happen. Like the, he just had this, he had a physical aura about him for a small man in a, in a, in a tough man's game that time. But he also had an aura off the field, that fearless, ambitious sort of sense of himself and a sense of ambition for everything that he put himself into. Hmm. What, what, was, what was he like as a person in terms of, like even his job, drove an oil truck, wasn't it? He drove an oil truck, that's right. I mean, it's, and as Michal alluded to there, by all accounts, a very quiet, shy man. But if you put him among his own people, he came out of himself. He always just wanted to be one of the lads. He didn't want to be singled out or picked out, you know, but this is at the same time, this is a guy who was brought out onto, you know, the mound of Fenway Park in 1954 in front of a packed Boston Red Sox crowd, giving a ball and said, see, can you hit the green monster? You know what I mean? And he did, he had a go. So like, you know, he had a, he had a bulletproof confidence in himself. So it wasn't that he was phased by any of that, but he just preferred the quieter life. Um, what you hear from people who would have been good friends of his was that he was intensely loyal, great man for advice and, and, and things. I remember a few years ago, I was driving back from West Cork and I was driving through a place called Dreamy League, which would be quite close to Dunmanway, be football country, really, I mean, you know, nominally speaking. But I went to, I, st- I stopped in to just get diesel and it was in the middle of the summer. Cork had just beaten Clare in the month's championship and 
there was a, was a roasting hot day, I remember there was a, an elderly man sitting out the front and he went in anyway. And when you went in, it was a small, real old kind of petrol job. No, it wasn't like a circle hair or anything. But there was a column in the middle of the room and there was a picture of Ring plastered onto it, just pinned onto it. And there was more pictures of Ring with Jimmy Barry Murphy. He's a famous picture before it was 78 all Ireland, I think it was it. Uh, with, with, with JBM and the bars gear and Christy Ring, the selector, and they're talking in the middle of Pocky Creek before an all-hour before the train such before finals. That picture was there. It was all these things. And uh, whatever way, anyway, I was paying for the diesel. And I kind of just said, you, it was a good wing yesterday or whatever. So we started chatting that way. And I said, You're, you remember Christy Ring? And he said, oh, he said, Christy was a great friend to us. He said, great friend. He sold us our first petrol pumps. He said, starters was off. Great friend was great. Starters was off 50, 60 years ago. And he said, I remember we were buying, we were talking about buying an oil tank. He said, we were buying a 500 gallon oil tank. He said, but Christy said, no, no, I said, get the thousand gallon oil tank. He said, because times won't always be bad. Times won't always be bad. And I thought, you know, that was a lovely I love you. And they ring then would deliver the oil and they became good friends and, and lots of conversations. But, you know, I was driving away and I was thinking to myself, you know what, that's it there, right there. Like times won't always be bad. So you always have to aspire to do better things. Always challenge yourself to do better things. Don't be afraid, like. And that was the fundamental thing with ring as a horror was the fearlessness. Like he threw himself into everything. And that was that was just that was the kernel of the man total confidence and complete fearlessness in terms of what he could accomplish. And I suppose the idea then, you know, taking that idea of a thousand gallon oil tank to sport, well, if you're not thinking big, you'll never be big. You'll never achieve big. You, things might be bad now, but you have to be ready for when things are good. So you have to be thinking that way. And Ring always had that, always had that ambition for himself and anybody he was with. And, you know, when you think about all of his achievements, and we've gone through all the Railway Cups, the fact that he won them all the way from 1942 and his final one in 1963, winning all those All-Ireland titles going from 41 to 54. Are there particular standout moments for him in what is pretty much a stellar career? I suppose the eighth All-Ireland, obviously, in 54 against Wexford. Um, he was there for the four in a row in the 40s. The great goal, um, it's, he scored a great goal, I think it was 1947, against Kilkenny. To, to, to beat them in the end. He ran in from the wing and he just rattled the shot. It's, it's considered to be his greatest All-Ireland final goal. Um, and he actually he actually recycled that as in, into a team talk before the three in a row final. They were they were below in the dress rooms in the park. And uh, <clears throat> according to Val Dorgan's book, excuse me, according to Val Dorgan's book, Frank Murphy, who was a county secretary at the time, had given a speech, but it had kind of... It had only risen the tension really around three in a row. So Ring stood up and he told this story about playing this crowd one time because they were playing Kilkenny in the 78th final. We played this crowd one time and I got the ball and I ran in and I kept running and they were running after me and I left them behind and then I hit, then I hit the ball and the next thing I saw the drops firing off the net because it was a soaking wet day. And that was it. And they kind of all left because they knew, like, the goal, the way he described it was like that. Simple, this is just what I do. But it was actually one of the great, great, great All-Ireland final goals. But this was how, this was his way of softening it for them, saying, look, at you just, basically he was what he was transmitting to them was, you just have to go out and do what you do. And if you go out and do what you do, you won't be too far off at all at the end. And then he gave whatever few words he had to say, and the whole atmosphere changed again. So I know I'm going to have to point now, but like I, I suppose that that 47 goal would, would I, I obviously had another life beyond it, like a lot of things that Ring did, I suppose in in that way. Again, we go back to the myth, like he could do something in a game, but a goal in a game that Ring scored could be worth three goals in the next game because talk of how he did it afterwards would percolate up through the country in the newspapers and people would be like, oh Jesus Christ, Ring is in form, you know that sort of way. Mm. So everything he did had an amplified reaction for the opposition next time around. And did he have any famous rivals that, that come to mind for you? Because I'm sure Tipperary would have been a regular a regular foe anyway. Well, of course. Like, like Tip, I suppose, the ones that come straight to mind for me, you know, when you think of Ring, is obviously the Hell's Kitchen and those Tipperary, those 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 Tipperary teams, the Wexford team of the 50s, obviously, who beat them in, in 54, uh, lost in 56 when he was going for the ninth All-Ireland medal. He had some very, I mean, obviously there was a very tempestuous All Ireland final in 1953 against Galway, where there was all sorts of accusations of targeting Ring and and, and 
just general school W that went on that uh, and that that controversy rumbled and rumbled and rumbled for a long time. But I think the you know you know what to do you know still it's that phrase that basketball phrase like game recognizes game and like when it came to when it came to his funeral and when it came to paying respects to the man I mean every legend of that era was there um and they all paid they all paid tribute to the guy I mean Jimmy Doyle the great temporary forward of his of, of his era like ring was his idol and again ring would deliver oil to 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 to, to Torles and Jimmy would see Ring practicing like he'd leave the aisle shook off. It was one of these cars, a bit like, you know, in football, you'd hear a Morris Fitz having a football in the back of the car and just stopping in random fields. Like, Ring was the same. He'd just stop and he'd be pucking the ball off a wall if he just felt the need. And, you know, Jimmy Doyle would see it. And years later, he would have roomed with Ring when they were playing for Munster. And, I mean, this was just, I mean, when you spoke to Jimmy Doyle about his career, these were the, these, these was, this was one of the joys of his life, was to be near him, was to be there. I think there was was there one story about Ring. Jimmy was trying to was in bed trying to sleep and Ring was just pucking the ball off the wall over his head the night before Ring the cup game in the hotel room. I don't know what the fellow next door said about it, but like just banging the ball off the wall. Um, but you know it was this. There was just this like universal respect and sort of you know we can debate now who was the greatest. We could you could talk about Shefflin. People talk about T.J. Reid now. Um, you know different people down down the years would have come into the greatest. But I mean, at that time, it seemed to be just kind of a universal sort of acceptance, even up and beyond Eddie Care, like in, in the 70s. That ring was the greatest, and that's kind of where the conversation ends. And it's a conversation, you know, it, it, ring had the great had the great line in relation to that, like that, you know, the greatest hurlers are with us now and still to come, you know, and th- that was his belief always. And it's, you know, it's what's... Um, it's what makes hurling so so exciting. Any sport, really, is it's what makes any sport so exciting, so thrilling. It's the prospect of what's to come. Yeah, and I spoke with his club mate, Tomás Mulcahy, earlier in the year because I just wanted to get a sense of how he was thought of within Glen Rovers. So uh, this was before the, the pandemic rage, sort of, which is crucial to some of what he says. But uh, here's what uh, Tomás Mulcahy had to say. What do you remember him, first of all, as a hurler? Now, when he, I suppose you were probably too young to really see him hurl much, if, if at all. I'm glad you said that, Shane. I'm not. I'm not that old, right? Even though 30 years ago, 1990, right? Um, look, I, I, I had, a, I have good memories of Christy Ring as well because I played with his son, Christy Junior, and we played with Christy Junior all the way up, uh, around the rage in Glen Rovers street leagues. Um, we weren't very, very good, but Christy used to be on the line. Christy used to be a selector. He go to all the matches, you know. So. Um, and it was probably pre- pretty difficult for his son, Chrissy Jr., living up to the standards of, of his own father, uh, even back then. And um, look, we went on to win, win a county championship medal together, uh, Chrissy Jr. But um, Christy was just, he was, he was an incredible guy because, I mean, anybody that you spoke to, I mean, the passion for the game, you know, the story of his uh, days when he was driving a tanker uh, for, for Shell Oil, I think, yeah. And... Um, he was traveling the country and inside inside the cabin was hardly in a sitter everywhere he went and every opportunity that he got out he was popping the ball against someone and like it's he it was just he, he, he was he used obviously um hurling brain and you know kind of famous stories when you see him as a selector with park you know the old stories you when you see him play and it was always about the skill it was always about the skill every time i spoke to him it was always how you could actually strike the ball off the air, how you could actually pull on the ground on your left hand, how you could actually score a goal by pulling on the ground on the, bo- on the ball, right? you know, and these things we don't see anymore in the modern game, but they were all Christie's traits, even you see him taking penalties there, any video clips and stuff like that, the effect of the f- three or four yards of the run and the lift, the pick and, and the strike was just incredible and, you know, you're, you're looking at the modern game and guys trying to perfect that. I mean, Christy was was just immense at that type of uh, play. Do you, did you ever puck around with him, or do you have any memories of that, or, and even how crisp he was at striking the ball? Ah, uh, look, he, he, you could, you could, he, yeah. He look, he was for us. I suppose he was kind of he was he was the hero. He was the hero around the country. He was the hero everybody around Cork. Um, yeah, he'd come along to the matches and stuff like that. But sure, look, I suppose for himself, I know he played to a very, very late age. But uh, I mean, he was, yeah, he'd have the hurry in the hand and there'd be a few little puffs back around the field and stuff like that. But it was nothing serious in that, at, that, at that stage. But it was more the verbals, the more more the advice, more more the having the chat. 
more coming up to you after the game, saying well done, giving it a pat on the back, you know. Um, and uh, he just loved, loved to be at Glen Over matches. Oh, what was he like? Um, like, would he have been a funny man? Was he a calm man, serious man, or that type of thing? He, he, he was a very serious man. Obviously, he loved his squash as well, right? So he was very serious at sport. I mean, fantastic squash player as well. Um, but he, he was very, very serious. But there was always a bit of wit, you know? He kind of... Uh, he might try, throw in the odd old story to you. He might throw in the odd old co- funny comment to you and stuff like that and just walk away and leave it there, kind of startled by, 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 by the comment itself, right, you know, and try to figure it out. But he's laughing himself as he's heading into the background, right, you know. So, um, no, look, I mean, I, I, I knew him. Could I say I had a brilliant relationship with him? I, I didn't because, look, I was just too young at that stage, right, you know. So, as you say, I was just 16 when he died. I mean, all the years previous to that, yeah, you'd have memories of him. But look, I mean, the day of, 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 of his death, right, you know, I mean, it was just incredible all over the country and to go to the funeral and to be down in Klein and stuff like that was, was just incredible, incredible uh, history attached to the band, you know. And uh, like, it, it's interesting that you talk about Glen Rovers, right? I mean, like he was born in 1920, so 2020, there's 100 years of, of, of memory and history of this guy, you know. So we in Glen Rovers are hoping to do a lot this year, you know, maybe have a senior hurling tournament with the guys, with the clubs that he played against in that in, the, in in those times, right? Because there were historic games. I mean, the history of our club is photographs laden with ring and all the Glen Rovers players as they, as they travelled all over our county, all over Munster, all over Ireland. They played against incredible teams like Mount Sign, you know, Thurla Sars, the Han and Limerick, all these great clubs. And the rivalry then that he had with these guys at inter-county level as well was just incredible. So um, we'll be doing a lot in Glen Rovers this year to, 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 in the memory of Christy. And just the final thing about it, do you remember hearing the news that he had passed and the shock that it was to you? Um, yeah, look, I, at 16, I suppose when you, yeah, you'd remember it. But my father and all the, 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 the Glen people, because like every day was Glen Rovers, right, you know, after school or training, you know, and... Um, it was an old Blackpool or own club house was down there at the time and stuff, you know. So um, he he was just it was just incredible, to be honest with you, because look, uh, not just alone around the Cork, but around the country, it was headline news, it was front page news, you know. I mean, now we've seen guys with like the Henrys with ten All Ireland medals and Tommy and Jackie and all those. I mean, this guy had eight All Ireland medals. He was he was God realistically in hurling terms. That's what he was. He was God because. Well, I hadn't seen him play live, but only listening to stories of Glen Rovers people, of Cork people, to say, look, they travelled the length and breadth of the country to see this man playing, you know, and the stories of him when he finished game and his last game, and people travelled from everywhere just to have the privilege of seeing Christy Ring play. Like, just listening to, to Tomas there, it kind of brings it all home, makes it very real. A guy who knew him, and albeit not very well, probably not, not many did. But uh, just fantastic thoughts from from me, our Tomas there. Yeah, like I mean, look, he was like Tomas said, he was mm-hmm. he was an iconic figure, and I mean, you know, iconic really is a word that's been damaged down the years. But this guy was, he really, really was. Um, and you can get you know, you get that sense that even even for people who maybe didn't know him as well as 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 older as as the older generation, they still felt this sort of. Um, they still felt this aura about him, um, and they felt the value of of Christie even acknowledging them <laughs> and sort of talking to them and giving them the little bit of advice. As I say, the little, the little small little tidbits, and you know, I, I, you know, to go back to that point again about he, by all accounts, he just had this ability to zero in on what you needed to hear at a given time as a hurler, and it would just fill you with confidence and fill you with understanding about what you needed to do. So you can imagine, like, I mean, God Almighty, for for a kid like Tomas Mulcahy growing up um you know we can only we can only imagine the impact that it had on tomas even sort of even subconsciously just as as, as a developing hurler who ended up obviously being a car captain in 1990 and, and winning all our medals and that um but for the glen it's a funny thing because the glen back that time certainly back that time was quite clannish and they didn't necessarily welcome outsiders with open arms you know they were they were a club that was born out of a very tight knit area of blackpool in the north side of cork city um very successful when christy ring arrived in 1940 you know obviously we know now christy was one of these great was one of the great was the greatest but they didn't know that then um but he actually ended up 
this guy from Klein coming to the Glen ended up actually embodying this notion of the spirit of the Glen. Like people slag off Cork people about Corkness a lot. Well, within the club scene in, in Cork, there was the spirit of the Glen. And Ring would, would epitomize a lot of that, this kind of, this relentless ambition to win and this, this again, this fearlessness and this commitment to, to go to wherever you need to go to, to win that contest. Forget the game, but just win that ball. Like mm-hmm. we'll do whatever we we we'll do whatever we have to do, and we'll be. As, I mean, you look at Patrick Horgan now, and I mean, even during the lockdown, some of the skills videos that were being thrown up. I mean, the Patrick Horgan ones were just insane. Um, and you just look at it. This is a this is the product of relentless practice, 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 and that's you know that's the spirit of the Glen as well, and that's the spirit of what Ring brought to Hurland. He just relentlessly practiced he never thought he never thought he had mastered his craft his craft was that was the beauty of the whole thing to him it was always a challenge mm. just hitting the ball it was a challenge you know and then Taoiseach Jack Lynch he spoke his graveside and said as long as young men will match their hurling skills against each other on Ireland's green fields as long as young boys swing their uh, commands for the sheer thrill of the feel and the tingle in their fingers of the impact of ash on leather, as long as hurling is played, the story of Christy Ring will be told and that will be forever. So just a thought on, I mean, Tomás spoke about his funeral and the amount of people who, who came out to pay their respects and, and his legacy. What would your final thoughts be on, on those particular things? Well, in terms of the... So to try and paint a picture of the funeral, I mean, it's, it's it was almost like a state occasion. Um, people who actually turned out, anything between, I mean, I've seen estimates of 25,000, I've seen 60,000. Um, the cortege went from Cork City to Klein, which is a journey of about a half an hour normally, but it took three hours to get to Klein. And, I mean, there was a huge amount of poignancy. I mean, even take away the hurdle, he was 58 years of age when he, when he died so suddenly. Um, so, I mean, it was an awful shock to people, and I'm sure it was a shock to the contemporaries of his of his time for ring i mean this this indestructible hurler who played his last game in 1967 to be dead 12 years later um it must it, it must have been an awful shock to everybody at the time um but there are very poignant poignant bits connected to it i mean they they brought his they, they brought him home and one of his teammates josie hartnett who hurled in the 50s with cork uh, he was with Val Dorgan, his, his subsequent biographer, and he, he made the point as a Glen man, you know, and the Glen always saw Christy as a Glen man. But they, you know, going to Klein to bury him, they realised, you know, we only kind of only had him on loan, you know. He he had a family back in Klein, and he had roots in Klein, and that was the place, you know, every Saturday and every weekend he went back and he hurled, and the place where his his family was and where his roots were and where he felt probably most comfortable. Um, I know he was going back there. Uh, you had, obviously, as I said earlier, you had every single great hurler still still alive at the time went to that funeral and they all took turns carrying the coffin to his grave. Um, and Paddy Barry, uh, the Cork goalkeeper back in the, back in the, in the 50s, um, he had his turn. And as he had his turn, he, he just, he made the remark, you know, having carried the coffin that, you know, we carried him at last. After all the years that Ring had carried Cork teams cork hopes had created that sort of expectation around cork if you like by dint of his own personal abilities personal personal capacity to change games and to win games for cork um that now at the hour when he was when he had departed them the players were still there by his side to help him and to help his family kind of over over to the to, to, to the very final whistle mm-hmm. Fantastic stuff, Michael. We could talk about him all day, but I really appreciate you you doing that with me. Michael Foley, the, the Sunday Times. Thanks very much.